Poor Thomas. Branded forever with the adjective doubting in a story that scholars agree is a creation of the evangelist we call John. It is yet another example of a literary fiction within the fourth gospel. Thomas is made to typify the doubts, skepticism, and hesitation that plagued all the early witnesses to the risen Jesus. Chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Most honorable are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. My friends, this gospel for the second Sunday of Easter is interesting. Secrecy, deception, and lying are so common and prevalent in day-to-day -day life in the Middle East of past and present day that every native entertains a healthy skepticism about everything. While a native Missourian insists that people who make mind-boggling claims should show me, thus implying that seeing is believing, natives of the Middle East would not agree. Do you remember the parable of Lazarus and the greedy man? When the greedy man experiences the punishment that his lifestyle has merited for him in eternity, he begs Father Abraham to send Lazarus back to his surviving brothers to warn them. Abraham replies, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, meaning if they don't believe the scripture that they read or that they hear read to them, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. With that in mind, what then is the purpose of the Thomas episode in the gospel we call John? The name Thomas is a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word to'am, which means twin. Greek-speaking early followers of Jesus from the late part of the first century would not understand Thomas, but they would certainly understand its Greek translation, Didymus, twin. Thomas probably was not a twin in the modern sense, but was rather given this name to distinguish him from another person with the same name as his. One tradition found in a work called the Acts of Thomas assigns him the then common Judean name of Judas Thomas, so that Thomas or Didymus would identify him as the other Judas in the Twelve. There were probably at least three disciples named Judas. The fourth gospel provides scattered glimpses of Thomas's personality. In John chapter 11, verse 16, Thomas stands out among the disciples as a strong man, willing to go with Jesus into hostile Judea, even if it should mean the death of both of them on a suicide mission. At the same time, this passage also hints that he is a disbeliever in what has happened and will happen with Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus. At the Last Supper, Thomas admits a certain lack of understanding about Jesus and his destiny. In the dark garden, Thomas apparently joins the others who forsook Jesus and fled. In many ways, then, Thomas is no better or different from his fellow disciples. 
Would the historical Thomas be offended to know that the evangelist we call John created a theological fiction about him? A story featuring him as a doubter? Probably not. This characterization is quite in accord with what is known of him in John chapter 11 verse 16 and chapter 14 verse 5. Some biblical scholars think that, story-wise, Thomas may indeed have been with the group back in chapter 20 verse 19, when the risen Jesus first appeared, and that Thomas initially didn't believe his eyes. At this appearance, Jesus shows the disciples his hands and his side. This action was most definitely intended to dispel their unspoken but very real doubts, and to assure them, and through them us, that this person is not a ghost, but the self-same Jesus of Nazareth who had been crucified and died on the cross. For these disciples, it seems that seeing is believing. No one asks to touch and verify the wounds. Thomas then presents a contrast. He wants to physically probe Jesus' body to confirm the wondrous. Yet when confronted with Jesus' invitation to touch him, Thomas backs off. He rapidly comes to his senses and confesses his loyalty. My Lord and my God. He accepts the risen Jesus' new invitation. Do not persist in your disbelief, but become a believer. Writing for a later generation of Messianists who were gradually being deprived of apostolic witnesses by their death, the author we call John composed this story of Thomas and the beatitude that concludes today's episode. Truly honorable or truly worthy of esteem are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Just as Thomas and his fellow disciples were able to make a significant cultural leap and suspend their suspicions of deception to believe what they saw, so too modern, scientifically-minded Christians who no longer have anything to see must believe what they hear. Paul reminds the Roman Jesus group, and us through them, that faith comes from hearing. One of the two themes contained in this Sunday's Gospel story, that of the so-called Doubting Thomas, we explored in depth in another video presentation. Here we focus on the vocation commissioning of the disciples become apostles, or sent ones. Even the most current studies attempting to understand the Jesus of history generally take little cognizance of the fact that he became incarnate in the ancient Mediterranean world. Anthropologists who specialize in this region and its literary records point out that approximately 90% of world cultures and 80% of circa-Mediterranean cultures readily experience altered states of consciousness. From the biblical record alone, which is included in the anthropological data bank, it is evident that the people of this ancient culture were certainly among that 80%. Studies of Moroccan Jews in Israel are particularly enlightening in this regard. When they were forcibly repatriated to Israel in the 1950s and 1960s, the Moroccan Jews carried with them not only their personal belongings, but their beliefs, values, and traditions. They revitalized their practices and attached them to new sites and new saints to substitute for those they left behind. One of these takes place at the tomb of Rabbi Shimeon Bar Yochai at Meren Yerzafed. On the anniversary of his death, these devotees make a pilgrimage to his tomb, celebrate a picnic-like feast in the surrounding countryside, and expect to see him in a dream. And they do. The dream pattern typically has four elements, common in Altered State of Consciousness Experiences, or ASC Experiences for short. 1. Those experiencing the vision are initially frightened. And 2. Do not recognize the figure appearing before them. 3. The figure appearing before them offers calming assurance. Do not be afraid and four, identifies herself or himself. It is I. Then the figure offers information. Maybe it's clarification of identity or the granting of a favor, for example, healing or a healing strategy. The purpose of the experience is to illuminate a puzzle in life or to suggest or approve a line of conduct. Notice that this is not a literary form, 
It is a pattern of human experience constructed by the culture rather than by someone's creative imagination. Jesus and those who knew him were quite familiar with and adept at experiences of alternate reality. Accounts of Jesus' baptism, transfiguration, walking on the Sea of Galilee, and post-death or post-resurrection appearances readily fit into the common Mediterranean cultural experiences of altered states of consciousness, even when the experience that is reported is so in an incomplete or selective manner. Aside from dreams and angelic appearances featured prominently in the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, the synoptics report five main incidents of such visions and or appearances in the career of Jesus. The dunking of Jesus, also called his baptism, an experience in altered reality. The testing of Jesus, also called the temptation of Jesus, an experience in altered states of consciousness. Of course, walking on the sea stories, which we have been dealing with at some length in these presentations. Another ASC experience. The transfiguration accounts of Jesus. Another example of Jesus in altered reality. And of course, the resurrection appearances also ASC experiences that we will deal with soon. A common literary form appears throughout the Bible to describe the divine vocation of a great patriarch or prophet who is called to be the leader of God's people. It can be found in the vocation stories of Moses, Gideon, Jeremiah, and Jesus' disciples. The complete form has five elements which can be identified in this Sunday's Gospel passage as follows. First, the introduction. The setting for Jesus' appearance to commission his disciples is a house with locked doors in which the eleven are gathered. In Jesus' nosy Mediterranean society, people suspect that those who gather behind locked doors are up to no good. Unlocked doors allow the children, the official spies or snoops or gossip network of the village, to wander in and out of homes at will, keeping everyone on the up and up. Elsewhere in the Gospels, when Jesus tells his disciples not to bar the children from him, he isn't saying anything sweet or endearing about wanting to be with youngsters. In effect, Jesus says, We got nothing to hide. Let them come. Blab all you want, kids. For this reason, the anonymous author of the fourth Gospel, called John, notes that the eleven were hiding nothing, but were rather protecting themselves against attacks from Judeans who did not believe into Jesus. This observation is truer of the Johannine Jesus group's time, especially after 90 Common Era in the first century, than of the days immediately following crucifixion, back in 30 Common Era. Historically, the followers of Jesus likely didn't hide out in an upper room, locked in safe. Instead, probably right after Jesus' arrest, they returned to their villages and work, wanting nothing more than to forget about their failed and utterly disgraced leader. It's likely that the first appearance of the risen Jesus to male followers happened on the shores of Galilee, as these fishermen mended their nets. But who can say for certain? Also, Western, scientifically obsessed people make a big deal about how the doors were locked when Jesus came. The locked doors have no relationship to Jesus' ability to penetrate them without opening them. This is not what the author is getting at. Neither Bram Stoker nor Stan Lee wrote gospel stories, and their concerns about superhuman characters were not those of the anonymous evangelist we name John. The fourth gospel is not the story of a superhero, folks. The second element of classic vocation stories is confrontation, reaction, and reassurance. The sudden appearance of the risen Jesus is a confrontation. 
This confrontation startles the disciples. Their reaction is fear. This reaction requires that Jesus set them at ease. Peace be with you, he reassures them. Then follows the third element of classic vocation stories, the commissioning. Three points characterize the commissioning ceremony laid out in the Gospel called John. 1. The commission is formal. As the patron has sent me, so I send you. 2. The sent ones are to preach metanoia and cancel the honor debts of sins. And 3. The commission is confirmed by Jesus' sending of the Holy Spirit. Generally speaking, sin, according to John, is failure to believe into Jesus as the one sent by the patron God of Israel. And you know what? This is also the basic meaning behind the declaration in the liturgy at communion time. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the one who takes away the sin of the world. Notice, not sins of the world, the sin. Please note the singular, the sin of the world. The Johannine Jesus group had a tradition about forgiveness of sin in this sense, a tradition for dealing with the sinfulness of its members. The forgiveness of sin mentioned here in verses 22 and 23, though, is quite different. It implies the task of bringing new members into the community, the Johannine Jesus group. From this perspective, the idea of this verse is similar to the instructions of Jesus in Matthew and Luke. The fourth element of classic vocation stories is objection. It falls to Thomas rather than the newly commissioned apostles to raise an objection. He implies that the apostles may have suffered delusion, or what we would call an hallucination, one of many alternative states of consciousness. He expresses strong doubt about the reality of the risen Jesus. His demand to stick his fingers into the wounds of Jesus in the story created about him by John is very well known. The fifth and final element of classic vocation stories is the reassurance, or sign. Ordinarily, the gods would be miffed by such objections. But in the Sky Vault commissions reported in the Bible, the divine response is very different. In this story, Jesus returns once again to the disciples chiefly to reassure Thomas, and through him, all followers who experience difficulty believing without seeing. The sign is the invitation to Thomas to stick his fingers in the wounds as he wished. Jesus' gesture works, and Thomas is convinced. Modern Western believers have become rather familiar with literary forms in the Bible over the past 50 years. Parable stories, healing stories, the letters of Paul, all these and more are reported in the Bibles in stock, stereotypical, unchanging forms. After learning about these many literary forms and their structure, modern Western believers and even preachers say, Okay, so what? What does this mean in the real world? This Sunday's Gospel describes how Jesus commissioned his followers to bring new members into God's covenant community. He had done this earlier in the farewell discourse. Careful study of the literary form and its structure convinces scholars that the commission is addressed to all disciples and is not limited just to the eleven. All believers are commissioned to bring new members into the community, the body of Christ. How does each one of us respond to this commission? Why did the historical Jesus gather around himself an inner circle of followers? Why did he call the Twelve to begin with? Was he a teacher looking for students? Or was he the founder of a religion looking for people he could trust to be leaders of churches? What was going on and how can we know it for sure? Just as we've seen that we can reach certainties about Jesus' existence, and cultural limitations, about how he understood religion, and what exactly his ministry was about, 
We can also be reasonably certain that the historical Jesus formed a political faction. In the ancient and contemporary Middle East, leaders gather followers and form political factions for the purpose of gaining some advantage over others. Those who follow a leader know and understand full well what the leader is after. They join the leader because they believe that in unity there is strength, that this group together can achieve more, and achieve it more effectively, than any individual might do alone. Each group member is strongly bonded with a leader. In contrast, the group members belonging to the political faction have, at least initially, weak bonds with each other. We glimpse examples of this in the political religious movement of the historical Jesus. This is in contrast to the later fictive kin Jesus groups of Paul, which were examples of domestic religion, with all members bound together as if they were related kin, with fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, and so forth. All sources agree that after Jesus' career was over, a group or coalition existed that previously had been closely connected to Jesus. If such a group did exist, then it must have been formed within the framework of Jesus' historical concern. And as we've seen, Jesus' historical concern was political religion, namely Israelite theocracy. Since Jesus' historical concern was with theocracy, then this group of inner followers was related to Israelite theocracy. They were a set of persons who witnessed to Jesus' politically religious program. Within a political institution, a group formed to support someone's program is called a faction. Hence, we can be certain that Jesus formed a political faction. Factions, by definition, are coalitions. That is, groups formed by a central person for a specific purpose at a specific time. But how can we know this for certain? By applying the prevailing scholarly criteria. The criterion of embarrassment demonstrates that the proclamation of Jesus, the kingdom of Sky Vault is at hand, Israelite theocracy is here, it's coming now, proved vacuous. The kingdom of God or Israelite theocracy never manifested. So why would gospel writers invent an embarrassment of Jesus proclaiming a theocracy and gathering together a faction around him to help him with this task if the theocracy never came? Answer, they wouldn't. Therefore, the only reason that the gospel writers would write about this is that Jesus historically must have done this for sure. And thus, we can know he gathered a coalition for this purpose, for sure. The criterion of incongruity shows us tension in the gospel documents. The gospels were composed by communities decades after Jesus and his first followers and primarily interested in Jesus groups sticking together, like fictive families, like fictive kin groups belonging to a domestic religion. But in the Synoptic Gospels, when we read about these 12 recruits, Peter and the other followers of Jesus, they act like a faction of a political religion. Rather than fictive kin group founders, as the later church spun them. Recall what I said earlier about how, unlike later domestic religious fictive kin Jesus groups, the Jesus movement originally was politically religious, with each faction member strongly bonded with Jesus the leader, but having weak bonds with one another. Should we be surprised that the brothers James and John, the sons of Zebedee, asked for the two highest places when Jesus comes into his glory? No. And neither should we be shocked by the angry reaction from the other ten, because these two beat them to the punch. Neither should we be surprised when, at the Last Supper, they all dispute among themselves about status and honor, and which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And we should also understand why, in the fourth gospel called John, the anonymous beloved disciple, it's really Lazarus stands out rather clearly as particularly favored by Jesus. He reclines next to Jesus at the table and obtains privileged information from him about the betrayer. 
Even Peter doesn't know this and has to use the beloved disciple as an intermediary to get to Jesus. All of these examples showcase something factual about the early days with Jesus. This inner circle of his followers were not really fictive kin members in a domestic religious Jesus group, and they certainly were not church founders, but rather, initially at least, were rival faction members, and they behaved as should be expected of such. The criterion of multiple attestation shows us that all the Synoptic Gospels, specifically elements taken from both Mark and Q, say that Jesus recruited a group of persons to assist him in proclaiming the forthcoming Israelite theocracy. And these independent sources mention this recruitment and an initial attempt at proclamation. Moreover, the pre-Gnostic version of Thomas mentions members of the Twelve it calls disciples, but they behave like faction members, not church leaders. But never does Thomas mention anything about them being the Twelve, or Twelve in number. The Gospel called John mentions the Twelve as disciples, and they behave accordingly. And finally, the criterion of coherence demonstrates consistency with Jesus' historical and cultural situation. All Synoptic Gospels report that group members accompanied Jesus on his final trip to Jerusalem, which is in conformity with a politically religious mission and typical of Mediterranean dyadic group personality types. And when he is arrested and shamefully put to death, in fear of being disgracefully associated with the apparently accursed Jesus, they flee. This definitely conforms to behavior in Jesus' Middle Eastern honor-shame culture. So my friends, we can know for sure that the historical Jesus called other poor, starving Galileans to be part of his political movement, the Jesus Movement. He formed them to be a political faction. Around him were an inner circle of followers. Later on, after they died, they were remembered at the roots of the first Jesus groups and gradually became legendary founder figures. Then, after centuries of pious anachronism, they were transformed into bishops, even monarchical bishops. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 recounts how the earliest followers of Jesus following his resurrection shared a group trance experience of the promised Spirit of God. It happened on Pentecost, an Israelite feast occurring 50 days after Passover. Pentecost is a transliteration of Pentecoste Chimera, meaning 50th day. Drawing heavily from the account in Acts, Christians living centuries later recontextualized Pentecost into a Christian feast. They celebrated Pentecost as the giving of the Spirit, the occasion when the Spirit of God empowered the body of Christ to proclaim the Word of God about what God did in resurrecting Jesus. But the Gospel of John gives a completely different account of the giving of the Spirit. For John, the Sky Vault Man Jesus breathes the Spirit on his only remaining followers even when lifted up on the cross. And then again, when the risen Sky Vault Man descends on the following Sunday evening, he once more bestows the Spirit. These are contradictory first century beliefs and contradictory accounts about the same reality. The Spirit was given. Neither Acts of the Apostles nor the Gospel called John are 21st century Western fact-precise biographies. Sorry, Americans. According to Acts chapter 2 verses 2 to 3, the alternate state of consciousness experience begins with a sound from the sky like a violent wind. All gathered followers of Jesus see divided tongues as a fire among them, that is, a flame over each one present. The sound of the wind and the sight of the flame introduce the experience of God's Spirit, demonstrated in their speaking other languages. Did that really happen? Did they actually speak other languages? Alternate state of consciousness experiences surely do happen and have been documented. 
But can people really speak foreign, previously unknown languages when in trance? In the Bible, spirit means an other than human person. Biblically, spirit always stands for action, activity, doing. So activity and effect demonstrates that the spirit is or has been actually present. The anonymous author we call Luke, writing in the fourth wave from the Jesus movement, decades after the twelve had died, reports that the spirit-filled group speaks in a range of foreign languages, in Greek, xenoglossia. This is different from a regular and routine spiritual experience Paul writes about generations earlier in his letters to the Corinthian Jesus group. Paul instead writes about the ecstatic speech called glossolalia. About glossolalia, noted researcher in contemporary ecstatic speech, Dr. Felicitas Goodman, explains, Speaking in tongues is an act of vocalization, of uttering sounds while the person is in the religious trance. The syllables uttered are empty of semantic content. Although Pentecostal Christians do believe that what they say is a language that could be understood if someone who spoke it was present. The theory is called xenoglossia. However, the syllables produced do not conform to the characteristics of a natural language as defined by modern linguistics. The confusion dissolves if we define speaking in tongues not as a language, but as communication. In this sense, speaking in tongues is communication between the Holy Spirit and the speaker, and between the speaker and the congregation. So, what happened? The discrepancies between the Johannine giving of the Spirit and the account told in Acts can be explained as different Jesus groups remembering differently the same truth, namely, that the resurrection bestowed powerful spiritual help on the early Jesus movement. But what about speaking in tongues? Biblical scholar Philip Essler, basing himself on Goodman's research, argues that the spinmeister we call Luke has either misunderstood the alternate state of consciousness experience or has intentionally exaggerated for effect. Folks, the Holy Spirit is real and can be and is really experienced in over 35 alternate states of consciousness, including glossolalia. In that sense, speaking in tongues is very real and still happens in various Christian and non-Christian groups. But it is implausible that the earliest followers of Jesus, or any spirit-filled people of any time or setting, were speaking unknown foreign languages. Xenoglossia does not happen.